Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. So tonight, on behalf of the Baha'i House and Worship staff, I'm so glad to see you here tonight. Thank you for coming. We have the pleasure of having Luke Slot with us tonight. Luke is a singer and songwriter from Ireland. Born into a musical family in Dublin, he began playing music at an early age, learning guitar and trumpet from his father, and studying piano at the Royal Irish Academy of Music. While still in high school, he was signed to Sony Music, but later set out on his own as an independent recording artist. He has toured extensively, giving concerts and music workshops in 20 countries. At the age of 21, Luke discovered the Baha'i faith and began incorporating the Baha'i teachings into his music. During the period of 2017 to 2019, the Baha'i community is celebrating two significant events, the bicentenary of the birth of Baha'u'llah and the bicentenary of the birth of the Baal. Those are the two founders of the Baha'i faith. In honor of these celebrations, Luke has released a new album called Gate of Heaven. And tonight, if you feel moved to applaud, Luke has requested that you hold your applause until the very end of the program, since many of the songs he will sing are based on prayers and sacred writings. So again, thank you for coming, and let's welcome Luke.
to their friends and neighbors and acquaintances to, to explore together, uh, very much in a mode of, of learning and exchange of ideas and, uh, and uh, mutual sharing of insights to explore what it means to build universal peace together in a way that, that actually includes the whole of humanity. And so tonight, uh, I'm not going to talk about building universal peace <laughs> because I think that's more of a conversation that needs to be had between all of us, probably multiple conversations to be had, uh, perhaps over a long time to be had together. But tonight, I, I hope you'll see tonight as an opportunity for something a little bit different, something uh, as, as an opportunity for us to, to reflect together through the vehicle of music on the significance of these two historical figures who have, who have uh, not only given to humanity a vision of universal peace, but have also provided for us practical tools necessary to make that a reality, namely the Ba'ah and Ba'ah And so uh, one quotation that I, I wanted to just share with you uh, on the subject of building peace um, is from Baha'u'llah, who said that the well-being of mankind, its peace and security, are unattainable unless and until its unity is firmly established. And so before we set out on tonight's program, which will last a little bit over an hour, um, I would like to just begin tonight by uh, singing a, a prayer from the Baha'i writings for unity. And this is called The Light of Unity. Oh, 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 it's 
So I've given tonight's event a, a special name, Immortal Youth, a musical tribute to the bar. And the reason that I've called this program Immortal Youth is because I'm going to conclude the program with a, a new piece of music, which is a, a musical arrangement of a, a recently translated piece of writing by Bahá'u'lláh that he wrote in honor of the bar. And this piece is called The Tablet of the Immortal Youth. And it's a beautiful, very poetic, mystical piece of writing uh, that lends itself very well to music. And, uh, but I wanted to, I'm, I'm going to play this piece at the end of tonight's program. But uh, I wanted to just give you a heads up that this, that this it's quite a long piece. And so musically, it's, it becomes a 20 minute song. So just so you know, I thought, uh, I thought I might warn you that when we get there, I hope that you can just you know, consider it as a, a, a kind of immersive musical meditation that you can just you know, uh, immerse yourself, yourselves in the words and, and sounds of this, of this piece for 20 minutes. But in order to get there, I thought that I would share with you a few other pieces along the way. And uh, in between the pieces, I, I, I would share with you a kind of a, you know, a, a, a brief overview of the story of the Bab, this, this young man whose life and work we are celebrating this year. And so in order to, to do that, to just sort of lay the ground for this tablet of the immortal youth, which, which will be later, I, I want to invite you all to, to, to close your eyes and to, to use your imaginations and to, to travel with me back in time. We're going to travel about 180 years back in time to the middle of the 19th century, which was this strange period of this, this worldwide messianic excitement. During this, this period in the mid-19th century, uh, different movements were being initiated in different parts of the world. People of different traditions, different religions were beginning these, these Kind of peculiar movements, because the central idea of which was that the, the ancient promises of the world's great religions uh, were going to be fulfilled in the 19th century. And of course, we know that all of the world's great religions are just replete with, with promises of a better future, a time in the future when when, uh, when they, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and they shall study war no more. And these, these movements became particularly prominent uh, among Christian communities in the West. And many Christian scholars, through their studies of the Bible, have, have become convinced that, um, that these promises concerning the end of the world and uh, from the point of view of the Bible, the, the second coming of Jesus Christ, seems to be pointing them towards the year 1844. And as these scholars in the West studied these, their scriptures, they kept finding this year, 1844, 1844, over and over again. And of course, there were people who laughed at this and mocked them and said, why are you, why are you getting so upset? This is all just superstitious nonsense. Nothing's going to happen. But some of these people became so convinced by all of this that entire communities of people in America and in Europe up and left their homes and traveled across the world to the Holy Land, where they settled at the, the foot of the famous biblical mountain, Mount Carmel in Haifa, to await the return of Jesus Christ. And these people lived there and they waited. And 1844 came and passed, and nothing happened. The stars didn't fall. The mountains didn't crumble. Jesus Christ didn't descend from the heavens. And well, the world didn't end. The sun rose, the sun set. And this period, which was known quite famously at the time as the Great Awakening of 1844, went down in history as the Great Disappointment. And many of these people moved on, and this was largely forgotten about in the West. But what many of these people of a Western Judeo-Christian background weren't aware of at the time was that at the very same time, an almost exactly parallel experience was taking place a little bit further east in the Muslim world. 
where Muslim scholars had come to the very similar conclusion that the promises enshrined in the Islamic scriptures concerning the end of the world and the coming of the great promised one foretold in the Quran were pointing towards the exact same year, that year of 1844. And so it was as if these different religions in different parts of the world, unbeknownst to each other, were all actually looking in the same direction towards the same event in the same year. And in the springtime of that year, a youth in Iran, who was known to his friends as a very humble, mild-mannered, sweet-natured person, sent a shockwave through the Middle East when he claimed that he was, in fact, the one that the people of both the East and the West were waiting for. But he told people that they wouldn't find him by looking up to the heavens. They would only find him by looking into their own hearts. And so I'd like to now sing another uh, prayer from the Baha'i writings about the heart. And this is called Creating the Pure Heart.
So at the time when this youth in Iran made this really staggering announcement, this came at a time when this excitement that, that, uh, that had been sweeping through the Middle East had reached such heights that, that um, special schools had been set up around the Middle East in places like Iran and Iraq with the express purpose of preparing people for the imminent coming of the promised one. And students were flocking from all over the Middle East to come and attend these schools and to, and to study all of the signs and, and characteristics and qualities that their traditions said that the, that, that the promised one would display when he, when he appeared. And when the, the leading scholar, the, the leading teacher, in the most prestigious of these schools, was lying on his deathbed. He gathered his students around him and he told them that the time had come for them to put away their books and to go out into the world and to search for the promised one. And most of his students sat around idle, not knowing where to go or where to start or what to do. But there was one particularly outstanding, diligent young student by the name of Mullah Hussein, who immediately on, on hearing the news of his, of his teacher's dying wish, set out in search of the promised one. And Mullah Hussein traveled, following the dictates of his heart, wherever his heart told him to go, he would go and he combed the earth searching for the promised one until eventually, he felt drawn like a, like a magnet towards the city of Shiraz in the south of Iran. And Mullah Hussein arrived at the gate of Shiraz on the evening of May 22nd, 1844. And while he was standing at the gate of the city, a youth appeared, walking towards him, smiling at him, 
And this youth came over to him and hugged him and welcomed him to Shiraz as if he were an old friend who had been expecting Mullah Hussein's arrival. And he invited Mullah Hussein to come to his home and have some tea and have some rest after his long journey. And Mullah Hussein was so enchanted by the, the charm and the manner of this young man that he accepted this invitation. He went with him to his home and the young man served him tea and began to ask him about his journey. And Mullah Hussein said that well, he was a student of this great teacher and he was out searching for the promised one. And the youth said to him, well, that's a, that's a momentous quest you're on. Uh, how will you know when you found him? And Mullah Hussein began to rattle off a whole list of these signs and characteristics that his teacher had taught him would be manifest in the promised one. He will do this and he will do that. He will be like this and he will be like that. And the youth sat there listening to all these signs. And to the great surprise of Mullah Hussein, the youth said to him, all these signs are manifest in me. And Mullah Hussein was shocked that this young man, who was barely 25 years of age and had no scholarly authority, no political or religious power, would, would dare to make such a presumptuous suggestion. He was a merchant. And Mullah Hussein began to get very uptight, and he began to challenge the youth, almost to the point of being a little bit rude to his host. <laughs> but what happened next left Mullah Hussein stunned in his seat. This youth stood up, picked up his pen, and began to write rapidly and speaking as he wrote. And before the gaze of Mullah Hussein, this young man began to unravel the mysteries of the Quran, the Bible, the ancient scriptures of the past, mysteries, the metaphors and allusions and symbols that have, that have baffled the greatest scholars for thousands of years. This young man, before the, the eyes of Mullah Hussein, was unraveling these mysteries with a poetic beauty and a, and a, a command of language that left uh, Mullah Hussein in a, in a, a state of, of, of awe, paralyzed awe, as he watched this young man perform this creative miracle. These words seemed to flow out of this young man's mind, through his pen, onto the page, unpremeditated, like a river of this poetic, spontaneous creativity flowing out of him. And when the young man finished writing, he turned to Mullah Hussein, and he said to him, I am the Baal, the gate of God. The promised one. And Mullah Hussein said that this, this declaration came upon him like a thunderbolt. He said he felt overwhelmed by the crushing force of what was happening. He wanted to jump up out of his seat and run out into the streets and scream at the top of his lungs that he had found the promised one. But the youth stopped him. He said, No, stay here. You know, you can't go out. Look at the state you're in. If you go out, people will think you're drunk. Stay here, and I will explain everything to you. And so Mullah Hussein sat there, spellbound into the night, listening to the Baal unfold the mysteries of life that he had, that Mullah Hussein had longed for so long to understand. And so, for the next song, I would like to sing for you some words of the Baal in which he states uh, who he is. Um, and I'm going to need a little bit of help with this one. So there's a very simple line at the, pan, at the end of the song, and it's a duet. And so I wonder if anyone who is willing to sing, and the more voices we have, the better, maybe we can have this, this, this side of the room sing this line. It goes like this. So I'll sing it first, and then maybe we can repeat it together. I am, I am, I am the promised one. I am, I am, I am the promised one. Can we try that together? I am, I am, I am the promised one. I am, I am, I am the promised one. One more time. I am, I am. Oh, 
So as the Bob's message continued to spread further and further afield, and more and more people began to prepare for the coming of him whom God will make manifest, the authorities in Iran became increasingly threatened by the influence that this youth was having, even though he had no power, he had no army, he had no weapons, all he had was his pen and his writings. And yet, these writings of the bar, these, these beautiful, poetic, eloquent verses that just seemed to flow spontaneously out of his pen with uh, the most brilliant, dazzling creativity, had this mysterious, transformative effect on anyone who read them with an open mind. They would, the people who read them, they would read these verses of the Baba, and their whole, the whole universe would be forever changed before their eyes. They would begin to see that everything was connected. They would begin to see, through the writings of the Baba, the oneness of themselves and everything and everyone else around them. And they, they began to, to with, this, with this vision that they, that they now had, they, they the way they saw it was that when human beings hate each other or, or, or kill each other or oppress each other, this is almost like a, like a global um, autoimmune disease affecting the whole of humanity as if, as if we are killing the very cells of our own body. And so from the perspective of these people, having, having come to see the connection and oneness between all things, the, the, the most absolutely rational, the most logical mode of operation in which to live was to love each other and to accept everyone and to celebrate the richness and diversity of humanity through the recognition of the underlying oneness of all people. But the authorities saw these teachings as a threat to their power over the people. And so they unleash a kind of a tidal wave of persecution against the Baal and his followers. In the space of a few short years, over 20,000 people, men, women, children, anyone who had dared to listen to the message of the Baal were slaughtered 
in the cities and villages of Iran in the mid-19th century. And one among those 20,000 was the young student, Mullah Hussein, who himself had been forever transformed by that encounter with the Ba'ath. And from that fateful night in 1844, he had dedicated the few remaining years of his life single-mindedly to spreading the message of the Ba'ath and this teaching of the oneness of all beings wherever he went. And eventually, having engaged in a series, uh, having, been, uh, uh, having been attacked in a series of attacks by government troops, Mullah Hussein, still at a very young age, sacrificed his life in order to defend his friends. And so I'd like to now sing uh, a song which I've written as a tribute to Mullah Hussein. And it's, I've written this song as a, in the voice of Mullah Hussein, as a kind of imaginary love letter in which he is, ded he is dedicating both his life and his death to the, the message of the Bab. And this is called Gate of My Heart. I was alone when the banks burst and the river came down from the clouds to be them and you were the one I had longed to find the honey to my tongue bombs in my mind so if I should speak but a word of you would the universe break would the trees split in two well I will not sleep neither close an eye until the day I will lie down I was born to die for you
that she told him not to fear, that he was in safety, and that she would guide him and inspire him with a message that would bring about universal peace on earth and would unite the entire human race as one diverse but united family. And so the story of Baha'u'llah is a story for another night. But after his eventual release from the Black Pit, Baha'u'llah wrote this beautiful tablet called the Tablet of the Immortal Youth, uh, in which, which he, he, uh, he dedicated to, to the Bab. And at the, at the beginning of the tablet, he, he writes that this, this has been revealed in honor of what took place in that year, that year 1844. And uh, a, this tablet has a story, it tells the story of this youth coming with his message and the, this maid of heaven coming with hers. And there's a very, you know, there's a very interesting relationship between Baha'u'llah and the Baal when you look um, at their writings. Because even though the two never met, they had this very special relationship and they wrote about each other. The Baal, of course, uh, constantly wrote about him whom God will make manifest. But Baha'u'llah also frequently wrote in praise of the Baal and always reminding people to never forget the Baal. Uh, and so really this, there was this kind of mutual relationship of divine love between the Baal and Baha'u'llah. And I think really that what Baha'u'llah and the Baal saw in each other and Indeed, what they have called on all of us to see in every human being was the image of God shining like the same sun reflected in different mirrors. And I think that through their teachings, if we were able to always look past those things, those surface things that keep us separate, be they uh, differences of opinions, or differences of political views, or differences of religious beliefs, if we're able to look beyond those things and see each other, see every human being as essentially a soul with, you know, made of the same substance as every other soul and endowed with the same potential to become uh, a noble, loving, courageous being. If we could just remember to see that in each other, perhaps that might be a foundation for universal peace. And so with that in mind, uh, I'd like to sing for you Baha'u'llah's celebration of the Baal, the tablet of the immortal youth. Wow. 
Wish you all a happy bicentenary of the birth of the bomb. Thank you very much. For yeah. wow. Wow.